The concept of the Jal has been narrated by over 40 companions. We have a hadith about the Jal in every single book of hadith without exception. The six books and Muslim Imam Ahmad and at tabarani and the books go on and on and on. The concept of the Jal is something that the hadith scholars say is mutawatir. And mutawatir is the highest level of hadith narrations. What it means? Too many people have narrated it. You know, if one person narrates, perhaps some can say his memory, this and that. I mean, perhaps one can say. But when you have 10, 20, 30, 40, in the case of Dajjal, more than 40 Sahaba are narrating from the Prophet ﷺ. You have more chains than you can count. Then to come and deny the Dajjal, to negate the Dajjal and the existence of the Dajjal, the only way you can do this is if you don't believe in hadith, okay? The only way you can end up rejecting the Dajjal is if you don't believe in hadith. And there are groups that did not believe in hadith and they still don't believe in hadith. And that's a separate topic altogether. That's their strand of Islam. For the majority of the ummah, especially the, those that ascribe to what is called Sunni Islam, as I say over and over again, the definition of Sunni Islam is to respect the Sunnah. That's why Sunni is called Sunni, from the Sunnah. We believe in the Sunnah as the second source of law after the Quran. There are groups that don't believe in the Sunnah, and that's their business, and that's a different topic altogether. For those who accept the Sunnah, and I am one of them, you cannot accept the sunnah and negate the Dajjal. Is that clear? It doesn't come hand in hand. Too many a hadith about the Dajjal. And as I said, they are every level. Sahih, mutawatir, authentic. And of course, there are some weak hadith about the Dajjal as well. But the concept is mutawatir. And we don't have time to go over all 45 narrations or 45 actual sahaba. There are more than 45 narrations. 45 companions narrated a hadith about the Dajjal. It will take us a number of dissertations to go over all of them. In a nutshell, what are some of the characteristics of the uh, Dajjal? Our Prophet wasallam mentioned that Dajjal shall be physically deformed. Multiple ahadith about him not being even up to the standards of a regular, you know, a normal human being. And a number of things are mentioned about him. Most prominently, the fact that one or both of his eyes is deformed. Our scholars have deferred, is it right or left? But uh, in, in all likelihood, it, it's really one eye. And so one eye will be festered. One eye will be basically like a floating grape or a festered grape, as our Prophet ﷺ said. Of the ahadith as well about the descriptions of the Dajjal, as we said, is that anybody who has an ounce of Iman will recognize the Dajjal because they shall see the word Kafir written on his forehead. And our Prophet ﷺ said, the illiterate person will read it just as well as the literate person. You don't need to be a, a literate person to even recognize uh, the concept of the uh, Dajjal. Of the things mentioned about the Dajjal, our Prophet ﷺ said, the Dajjal shall have no children. Aqimun la yuladu lahu. The Dajjal will not have have any children. So the Dajjal will be a person who will come towards the end of times and of the characteristics he shall claim to be the Messiah and then he shall claim to be the Rabb himself. So there's going to be a coming bigger and bigger of his claims. He shall claim to be Allah Azza wa Jal himself. He shall claim to be the Rabb. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam explicitly said this, that he shall claim to be the Rabb and know that you shall not see your Rabb in this world. So the concept of seeing Allah is valid, but not in this dunya. So he linked the concept of seeing Allah with the Dajjal. He said, know that you shall not see your Lord in this world, because you will see him when? On Judgment Day and in Jannah. You will see him in the Akhirah, inshaAllah ta'ala. May Allah make us amongst them. So he said, you will not see your Lord in this world, meaning anybody who claims to be God is lying. Nobody that you will see will be God in this world. And he also mentioned that I will tell you that the Dajjal is one-eyed and your Lord is not one-eyed. What does it mean your Lord is not one-eyed? It means Dajjal will not even be a perfect human being. How can he be God? 
Even his imperfection is obvious. He doesn't even have two eyes. Your Lord is not imperfect. Your Lord Azza wa Jal is Jalla Jalalu. He is perfect. You will see Dajjal. You will recognize him. He's not even, he has the regular capabilities of a human. How then can he claim to be God? And Allah Azza wa Jal will not be seen in this world. And Allah Azza wa Jal is Laysa bi A'war. He is not one eye. Of the things that are mentioned as well about the Dajjal is that he shall walk with crooked legs. His legs will be basically uh, not straight legs. So another deformity that he will not be walking normally. All of these are meant to emphasize as well that the Dajjal is a person who has physical imperfections and yet in his arrogance he is claiming to be God himself, to be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In one hadith in Tirmidhi, our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the Dajjal will come from an eastern land that is called Khurasan. That the Dajjal will come from an eastern land that is called Khurasan. And groups of people will follow him. They will be as if their faces are hammered out, uh, are hammered out um, uh, shields, hammered out shields. So a shield that has been hammered out, i.e. a flat face. Now, some have said these are the description of the Eastern folk and Allah knows best. But the point is their facial features will be something that is atypical for the Arab race. So for the Arabs, they will not find them to be of their race. The majority of people that will follow him will be from that other uh, race as well. Our Prophet said, and the hadith is in Musnad Imam Ahmad, and it is a Hassan hadith, that the Jal will come from a city called Isfahan. So it is mentioned by name. The Dajjal will come from a city called Isfahan, from the Yahud of the city of Isfahan, and many of his followers will be from that city. 70,000 of the Yahud of Isfahan will be his followers. And therefore, we see from this that the Dajjal, his background will be from the Bani Israel. And many of his followers will be from the Bani Israel. And in another hadith, it is mentioned that he shall come between the lands of Iraq and Sham. So how do we reconcile? He shall come from Isfahan and he shall come between Iraq and Sham. And our scholars have said that he will first appear, his first claim will be in Isfahan. But he will get global attention between Iraq and Asham. So there's going to be levels of his appearing outward. There's going to be levels of claiming. And his first claim will be in Isfahan. In the land of Iran is Isfahan. And of course Isfahan, by the way, interesting footnote here, that from the first uh, temple's destruction of Babylon, the first batch of the diaspora of the uh, Bani Israel, they migrated to Isfahan. And to this day, there is a group uh, from, that, uh, from that religion in the people of Isfahan to this day. From the first destruction of the temple from the days of Nebuchadnezzar. These are the Yehuda of the diaspora. And they are still a small group. They used to be much more in number before 1947. But of course, because of the creation of the country and many of them migrated to that land. So in all Arab and Muslim lands, they become very small. But there is still a synagogue in that city. And there are still people of that faith tradition in that city. And our Prophet said that the Jal will come from that particular uh, land and that particular city and that particular race and religion. And he will be from that uh, people. Also, we learn in the authentic hadith that the Dajjal will come at a time of great chaos, bloodshed, hunger, starvation, and he will provide his followers safety and security. This explains why so many people will follow the Dajjal. You see, Alhamdulillah, most of us have never been hungry to the point of us going almost mad. We don't understand. When you are hungry, you lose rationale. When you cannot feed yourself or your children, you will do desperate things. May Allah protect us from ever seeing that day. The people of that time frame will be tested by trial, war, bloodshed, hunger, starvation. Here comes a man who appears to be powerful in terms of his army, who will grant you safety and security if you are on his side. Our Prophet ﷺ said, he will command the skies to rain and they will rain. 
Our Prophet said he will distribute bread and food. One of his signs, he will be giving food left, right and center at a time of starvation. When people are starving, they're willing to do many things. He will demand his followers believe in him first as the Messiah and many of them will. When they believe in him as the Messiah, he will then up the notch. He will then raise the bar or we should say lower the bar. And he will say, I am your God. I provide your food for you. I provide your drink for you. I give you safety and security. And so his followers will then take him as a God. And he will at that time frame give his followers food and drink. And many other people will not have that food and drink. And so people will begin to follow him en masse. And this is the fitna of the uh, issue of the Dajjal. As well, our Prophet ﷺ said that he will have the shayateen at his disposal. He will have the shayateen at his disposal. So the shayateen will do things at his command. And the shayateen are able to do what we are not able to do. The shayateen do not have supernatural powers. They have superhuman powers. The two are different. Supernatural is not the same as superhuman. A horse has superhuman powers. It's faster than us. It doesn't make it supernatural. Okay? An elephant has superhuman. It's stronger than us. It's not supernatural. Jinns have powers that Allah has given them. Once we understand their powers, there's nothing strange about them. Nothing strange. It's just that the only thing that we should understand is that they're in a world that we cannot see. He, shaitan, sees you from a dimension you cannot see him. The jinn are faster than us, stronger than us, and they're invisible. That's it. Faster and stronger, many creatures are faster and stronger. We're not scared per se of supernaturally scared, even of lions. We're not scared supernaturally. We might be scared a natural fear, but we're not terrified in the sense of supernatural. The only thing that freaks us out is that jinn are in the world of the unseen. Otherwise, if we understand that the jinn are faster and stronger, what they can do is they can lift more than a human can lift. But they're not supernatural. They cannot lift the whole world and all that is in it. They can lift maybe what five people can lift up, like the story of Suleiman and carrying the throne. They're faster than us. They can go faster at the speed of light. Other than that, they are natural creations of Allah. So these entities will declare their loyalty to the Dajjal. Once they declare their loyalty to the Dajjal, they will willingly cooperate with the Dajjal. And the Dajjal will appear to be a very powerful, supernatural person. In reality, he simply has some of the tricks and trades of the jinn. The jinn will make illusions. The jinn will lift things up. The jinn will... And the people will not see the jinn. The Dajjal will say, do this and something will happen. And the people will assume that it is the power of the Dajjal. It is also possible that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will test the people by giving the Dajjal one or two issues that others do not have. Just like Allah has given shaitan himself something that we have not been given. And that is a long life, right? Did not Allah give shaitan something that we do not have? And that is life until, until judgment day. No other person has that. No other person, no human being has that. And Allah Azza wa Jal gave it to shaitan as a test for shaitan and as a test for us as well. So it is possible that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give Dajjal certain privileges and powers that are a test to him and are a test to those who follow him and will be a sign of iman for those who reject him. And of them is the power and the capability to cause the sky to rain because jinns don't have that power. Jinns cannot cause the skies to rain. Only Allah can do that, right? As Allah says in the Quran, who is the one who sends the matar from the heavens? Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah can give that power. As well, He will have the power to at least once 
maybe, maybe more, but the minimum is once. He will have the power to resurrect the dead. And that is another thing that he resembles with the true Masih, and that is Isa ibn Maryam. That's why he is the false Masih. There are certain things in common, but Isa ibn Maryam said, worship Allah, and Dajjal says, worship me. That's why he is Dajjal. So, for sure, he will resurrect one person at least from the dead. But in all likelihood, he will pretend to resurrect other people from the dead. This is explicit. It is mentioned in Sahih Muslim that a person will come and not believe in Dajjal. And he will be a person who doesn't know Quran, Sunnah, he is a Muslim, he doesn't know much. Dajjal will say, what if I resurrect your parents in front of your eyes? And what if I tell or your parents tell you to believe in me? Will you believe in me? So he says, of course, if my parents come and say, hey, then I'll believe. So he will command the shayateen to take on the forms of the parents of this person. You see, shayateen can come in forms. You know, this culture believes in ghosts. Whenever we get to the issue of jinn and whatnot, we will say, there's no such thing as ghosts wandering this world. The ruh does not remain, the ruh goes. But what can happen is the jinn can take on the form of a person. So that when you see that entity, you think it is that person who has died, but it is not that person who has died. The person who has died is gone. That's it. They're not going to come back. But the jinn can take on the shape of that person. So the jal will tell two jinns to come in the form of the parents of that person. And the person will then see his own mother and father. He will think they are in the flesh. They are not in the flesh. They are jinn. And his mother and father will say, Oh my son, this is your Lord, worship him. This is true, worship him. So the man, naive, innocent, he goes, okay, my mother and father say so. He can, you know, my Dajjal, he will think it's God himself, can resurrect the dead, then I will believe in him. So the Prophet warned us that he will have tricks and trades. He also said he will have with him Jannah and Naar. Some have said it literally means a fire and a garden. Some have said it means he will come with what appears to be blessings and lots of punishment. Both are allowed here because Jannah represents money and fruits and you know sustenance and Na represents punishments and torture. So it could be that he actually has a physical Jannah and Na and it could be that what the Prophet is saying because the Arabic allows this and we're going to come to this issue when is it metaphorical, when is it literal? You know Jannah can indicate luscious gardens. It can indicate lots of fruits and pleasure, pleasures. So he will have with him pleasures and he will have with him punishments and tortures. So our Prophet said, realize his pleasures are actually his torture. And what you think are his tortures are actually Jannah. So if one of you sees it and cannot escape, the Prophet said, he should jump into the punishments and that will save him. So if you have real Iman in Allah, when you see Dajjal and he has his torture mechanism, he has entities that you think will harm you, will kill you. The Prophet ﷺ said, jump into what you think is harmful and you will be safe. Now, it is possible, and Allah knows best, it is possible that these nar that you see are the shayateen. And when you jump into them, you are demonstrating, what are you demonstrating? Hmm? Iman. You are demonstrating Iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the only way to fight the shayateen, you cannot fight them with your fists, can you? They are stronger than you. You cannot take them down with your physical strength. The one thing that you have that will diminish the shayateen is your Iman in Allah. Our Prophet sallallahu hadith is in Abu Dawood. He was on an expedition and a certain person's camel went upward and almost threw the person off for no reason. In the middle of the desert, the camel just goes up. So the man or the woman said, May Allah curse shaitan. Shaitan caused my camel to do this. The Prophet said, Do not mention shaitan like that because if you do, his ego will become so big, he will become bigger than a house because you ascribed this to shaitan. Rather say, Bismillah. And when you do so, shaitan will become smaller than an atom. 
What was the power that was used? The name of Allah. The name of Allah, Iman, caused the shaitan to become insignificant. It is possible, it's not too much of a stretch, to say that the Dajjal will have instruments of protection, looks like protection and food and drinks, and instruments of torture and evil and whatnot. When the people see, they will be terrified and they will rush to the gardens thinking that that's going to save them and that's going to destroy them in the Akhirah. Our Prophet ﷺ said, if you have no choice, you have between the garden and the, and the fire, jump into the fire of the Dajjal. It is very possible, it's not a stretch, that this, as we said, torture of Dajjal might actually be physical, could be armies of evil people and, 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 and you know, whatever, jinn, shayateen, and if you jump into it, putting your trust in Allah, you will go unharmed. Everybody will run away and you will be safe because your iman in Allah will save you. So this is the test of iman when you see the actual uh, Dajjal. Also, our Prophet ﷺ described the Dajjal as being Ahmar. And Ahmar means what? Oh, Arabs, what does Ahmar mean? Red. Do you think he will be red, red? Dajjal will be red? Brownish? You made him a Desi? No, no, no. We just said, where is he from? He's not a Desi, don't worry. What is red? Hmm? The Arabs of old, they would call what we call in modern vernacular Caucasian, they would call them reddish or yellowish. Ahmar or Asfar was the term the Arabs used to describe the Caucasian types of people. Okay? The term white was not, and generally abiyad wasn't used to describe skin color. Okay? Ahmar, because... And what happens when they go in the sun, you know, yani the, the tan and whatnot, you know, they become ahmar, literally like it. So the, t the notion of them being yellowish or reddish, right? So when the hadith mentions any nation or race as being yellow or red, this is our equivalent of that, uh, you know, pers uh, uh, complexion, okay? So he did, the process and described him as being ahmar. And ahmar means basically of that uh, race and again it fits into the description of uh, the ethnicity of the Dajjal as well the Prophet said that uh, he, his hair will be curly Ja'ad Ja'ad is curly hair his hair will be curly he also described him as being relatively short he also described him as being broad chested he also described him as we said as having legs that are not straight so he's not walking in a straight gait he has basically deformed legs so these are all descriptions that are given of the uh, dajjal and he also mentioned in hadith in musnad imam ahmed that the majority of people who follow dajjal will be from uh, the yahud and also he said from the women now why will the women follow the dajjal uh, because of the safety given at that time, there will be chaos. At that time, there will be hunger and starvation. And so those who choose to follow the Dajjal, they will have that safety. And so it is possible that in that time frame, in that chaos and whatnot, people, certain types of people will be attracted to the false promises of safety that the Dajjal uh, gives. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned that the Dajjal will appear between, the, between Iraq and Asham. And he will go through every single city in the world. The point is that the majority of cities and the large cities in the world, the Dajjal will go through all of those uh, cities, except of course for which city? Mecca and Medina. And we learn from the ahadith that our Prophet wasallam said, he shall try to enter Mecca and Medina. He shall <clears throat> try to enter Mecca and Medina and he shall be stopped at the gates of Mecca and Medina by the angels. So if you want to be safe from the Dajjal, one of the things that you can do is to flee to Mecca and Medina during that time frame. In the hadith in Sahih Muslim, our Prophet wasallam said that Dajjal will try to enter Medina and he shall be prevented from doing so. And then he shall cause the city of Medina to tremble three times is an earthquake. So the jinn, the shayateen will stamp on the city and there will be the notion of the earthquake. So people will think this is the destruction of Medina, that the Dajjal is causing the destruction of Medina. So our Prophet ﷺ said that the munafiqoon will all flee Medina and Medina will be left 
pure with believers. Who will remain in Medina? Those who believe in the hadith. Those who believe in hadith, do you understand where I'm coming from? It's prediction. When Medina will start shaking and there's a man outside the door claiming to be God, you have already been warned by the Prophet ﷺ, stay in Medina. So the only people that will remain in Medina will be the ones who believe in the Prophet ﷺ and not in Dajjal. So our Prophet ﷺ said, Medina is like a furnace. It separates the chaff from the purity. It separates the, 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 the abnormalities or the, the, the fil it filters the filth from the pure like the furnace does. The furnace purifies. You know, the mineral ore comes out, purifies. Medina is like a furnace. And he said this hadith in the context of Dajjal. So Dajjal will filter through Medina. And therefore, this also explains when I talked about the Mahdi three or four weeks ago, why will many of his followers, the Mahdi, why will his followers be from Medina? Because Medina will be 100% pure. 100% pure. So who's going to go and fight on the side of the Mahdi and on the side of Isa? The people of Medina will stay there and they will then go out when the, when the uh, Mahdi comes. That is when the people of Medina will exit and they will fight under the banner of the Mahdi. And the Mahdi, of course, will be fighting the Dajjal as I have already mentioned when we talked about the Mahdi. So the Dajjal will come to Mecca and Medina but will be prevented from entering. And wherever he goes, he will gather more and more followers and he will gain a very, very large army. Now, we also learn uh, that uh, the, uh, the Dajjal will go to Medina. This is a very interesting hadith. And I actually looked this up uh, when I first read it. I couldn't believe it was that explicit. I actually went back to Muslim Imam Ahmad and looked at it. But this hadith is in Muslim Imam Ahmad. And it says that the Dajjal will go to one of the mountains outside Medina after he has been denied entry by the angels. And he will take his followers to one of the mountains outside of the Haram's boundary. Outside of the Haram's boundary. Folklore and superstition says that it is the mountain where one of the major palaces is, but Allah knows best. That's folklore and superstition, which might not be far from the truth given all that's happening right now. But anyway, so the Dajjal will take his followers to that mountain. And the Hadith says, he shall point to the masjid and he shall say do you see that white house al bayt al abyad the white house not the white house here in dc do you see that white house that is the house and the masjid of ahmed and he will call him ahmed not muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam why is this so interesting because if you ever fly into Medina, if you look down from the airplane, you will see a massive white complex. Because it's all marble. And you can see it for many, many miles. And you can see it from the mountain tops. You can see it from the plane. I have had the pleasure of flying into Medina many, many times. And it is truly beautiful. It's beautiful. Because the, this is a very massive complex, as you know. And it is white. And you can see it from far away. And the hadith explicitly mentions that he will see in the distance. He will point to a complex. And he will call it the white masjid and the white house. And he will say the house is white meaning, right? That white house is the house of Ahmed, the masjid of Ahmed. And it is something that, you know, Allah knows best. The very structure that we have. Allah knows best because it is a very sturdy structure. It will last Allah knows how many hundreds of years or we hope that the Dajjal will not come in our lifetime inshallah. So we hope it will last many hundreds of years and it might be that very structure and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Now we also learn from, and this is not explicit but it's inferred from the hadith of the Mahdi. It is inferred from the hadith of the Mahdi that the forces of the Dajjal and the Muslims will be fighting multiple battles. And the Muslims will be able to protect themselves partially, but they'll never be able to destroy the army of the Dajjal. This is a very, very key point. That the Dajjal will not be victorious in every battle, but he will be protected as a person. He will not be harmed by, or at least killed, Allah knows if he's going to be harmed, by anybody other than obviously who? 
Isa ibn Maryam. Okay? And we're going to talk about Isa but maybe in the next lesson or whatnot, the coming of Isa and the, and the signs of that. So the Dajjal and his army will fight multiple fights, not just one. And maybe, Allah knows best. And again, all of this is surmising. It's not even going to be one army in one location. Rather, there will be the forces. Which side are you on? Are you on the side of Dajjal or on the side of the truth? So the world will be divided into two camps. Not necessarily one physical army, but two camps, two entities. You are fighting for the Dajjal or you're fighting for the truth and righteousness and taqwa and Allah and His Messenger. And it is possible that some of the battles and the skirmishes, the Muslims will be victorious and some they will not be victorious. And we know this because of the hadith of the Mahdi. Because the Prophet is saying that they're fighting the army here, they're fighting the army there, until finally they will hear the cry that the Jal has come out and he's attacking your family. So they're going to go back in fear that they're going to see the Dajjal and they will find out that it is a false cry. Which means during that time frame, people will begin to recognize this is the end of times. And the smallest rumor will provoke theories of Dajjal. And there will come a time frame where they're just waiting, when is the Dajjal, when is the Dajjal? And it will indeed happen that the Muslim army with the Mahdi is fighting somewhere, we don't know where. And the, the, the news, the rumors will come, Dajjal has come where you left. Wherever you were, Dajjal is now where your families were. So they're going to rush back towards Sham. That's where they're going to be based, Bilad al-Sham. They're going to rush back to Sham only to discover that the Dajjal has not yet come. Then the Dajjal will come. And we don't know how long between this news of the Dajjal coming, but eventually then the Mahdi will be leading them in Damascus, as we already mentioned, in Salat al-Fajr, and Isa will then come down. Okay, so all of this will happen in the time of the Mahdi, the fighting of the Dajjal. This also means, and again, Allah knows best, all of this is kind of sort of deriving. And it's very terrifying in light of what is happening right now. And this is an interpretation. That the forces of good and the forces of evil will begin to demarcate before the coming of the Dajjal. And before the coming of the Mahdi. Because... There's already wars going on and there is no Dajjal. There's already fighting taking place and Dajjal has not yet come. The situation is being prepared for the coming of Dajjal. So it appears that there will be skirmishes, major wars, bloodshed. In some ahadith it is mentioned out of 199 will die. So what happiness will the survivor have? When will that happen? With Dajjal or before Dajjal? We do not know. We do not know. There was going to be a massive war. The Prophet ﷺ said that the bird that is flying above will fall down dead. Is this nuclear war? Something like this. Again, these are all ahadith that it's not too far-fetched to read in nuclear war. Right? As Einstein famously remarked, I don't know what World War III will be uh, fought with, but World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. It's a very profound statement. I don't know what World War III is going to be fought with, but whatever it is fought with, that's it, that will be the end of civilization. Because too much nuclear power is too much what not. World War IV, if there ever is one, will be with sticks and stones. And by the way, this also goes to another issue. These are hadith about horses in the time of Dajjal. These are hadith about swords and what not. Do we take them literally? Allah knows. Both opinions are valid. And it is permissible to call a weapon a sword. And maybe there are some fancy weapons and whatnot. And it is also not unfeasible, not unrealistic to assume that towards the end of times, all technology as we know it will be gone. And the only way that we can imagine this to happen is a real and true Armageddon. You know, there is this genre of movies not that I'm encouraging you to watch movies, I'm just telling you this is the reality. There's this genre of movies that, you know, the apocalypse uh, eclipse happening, or what's going to happen after the nuclear explosion. And in almost all of them, what do we see? Common sense logic dictates that when this whole world goes to war, next time may Allah protect us, and nuclear weapons are used everywhere, what is going to happen to civilization? It's gone. 
We're going to be back to sticks and stones. We're going to be back to lighting fires with not even matches, but rubbing things together. Like We're going to go back to that time frame. So it is not inconceivable at all to interpret these ahadith literally that the Dajjal and his followers and the Muslims and the Mahdi will literally be fighting on horses and, and, and swords and whatnot because all of that will be gone. Or to be metaphorical is also possible. All of this is, I mean, it's not too much of a stretch as well. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows um, best. So this, these are some ahadith about the Dajjal. And obviously... And obviously the issue of uh, Dajjal uh, coming towards the end of times, our Prophet ﷺ said, he shall live 40 amongst you, that famous hadith. He shall live 40 amongst you. How much 40? He said, one of them will be like a year. One of them will be like a month. One of them will be like a week. And the rest will be like your regular days okay the rest will be like your regular days so you can calculate what is this going to be one year plus one month plus one week plus all of the rest of them will be regular days now what does this mean again remember the hadith of the end of times are cryptic always the slave shall give birth to her master what does it mean barefoot naked shepherds are going to compete with tall buildings is it literally barefoot and naked or their ancestors were barefoot and, and shepherds? Because as we said, these princes, they are not barefoot and, and, and shepherds anymore, but their grandfathers were. Again, a little bit of crypticism, Allah knows best. So what does it mean the first day will be like a year? Does it mean that it will actually be one year? And so the time frame of Dajjal will be one year, one month, one week and 37 days? Or does it mean that time will appear to go slow? Nuclear weapons, Armageddon, Allahu Alam. Does it mean that everything will just appear like that for a long time frame? Allahu Alam. The famous hadith in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim, and this shows us the status of salah. When we hear these hadith, our minds goes here and there. So when the Sahaba heard it, the first thing they said, Ya Rasulullah, how do we pray in that year that is a day? Yani they are so much into salah, right? That the first thing their minds ask is, how do we pray in that year that's going to be a day or that day that's going to be a year? And our Prophet said, you estimate it. You estimate it. So, uninterpretation, and this is all ijtihad, uninterpretation is that there will be no sunlight for a year. So it will appear that for one full year, it is as if it's a day and night. And that's why our Prophet said, you keep on estimating the times of salah. You keep on estimating the times of salah, even if you don't see the sun and the moon. This is uninterpretation. And the only way that there will be no sunlight all over the world is once again, if these weapons of mass destruction. The irony is the very country that claimed others have weapons of mass destruction is itself guilty of having the worst weapons of mass destruction. Allah knows best. A very valid interpretation, which I don't see to be unreasonable, that that year will be an actual year. It will be an actual year. 365 days, but people will not be able to recognize them as day and night. And then slowly but surely the smog will settle, whatnot. And so the next one will be like a month that, okay, things are clearing up and then whatever might happen. So Allah knows best. This could be an interpretation where we can reconcile. Or time can go slow. I mean, Allah ala kulli shayin qadir. And there's nothing yani, either way that we can do this. But we learn from this that the Dajjal will be on this earth for a period of time that is reasonable. It's not that much of a stretch. Even if we say 40 days, the first one of which is a year and then a month. So in total, it's less than two years, right? In total, it's less than two years, a year and a few months, right? Uh, two months and something. That's not too long, alhamdulillah. Now, the Dajjal will be here, meaning he shall be Dajjal for that time frame. He will grow up, as we said, a regular child. He might not even know he's the Dajjal when he's growing up, or maybe he will, we don't know. 
one of the two. As the hadith mentions, he shall appear when someone provokes him, which means in Isfahan, something's gonna happen and he's just gonna go berserk and ballistic and then realize he has these powers or jinns or shayateen that others don't have and then take it from there, take advantage of that and go from bad to worse, declare himself the Messiah, get his followers, eventually go ahead and declare himself God himself and all of this is gonna grow worse and worse and worse. So all of these are the ahadith of the uh, Dajjal.